Goedendag iedereen en welkom op deze uitzonderlijke keuze voor het verhaal in de sfeer lezen. Uh, ja, dank u dat jullie nog zo talrijk zijn uh, opgekomen. Ik kom er nog niet op wel uh, Dus vandaag bij de grote eer om uh, meneer Roger Scrat, een van de belangrijkste conservatieve denkers van de Europa en de wereld eigenlijk, uh, voor ons te komen spreken. Hè. Dus uh, vandaag zal meneer Scrat het hebben over uh, de relatie tussen het klassieke liberalisme en het conservatisme. Vooral omdat dat in de Anglo-Saxische landen wat dicht bij elkaar ligt. En uh, daarna zal hij het ook hebben over zijn nieuwste boek, Groene Filosofie, Green Philosophy, waarin dus uh, wordt uitgelegd hoe dat het milieu beter af is zonder staat en dan met de tegenstelling tot wat we denken. Dus uh, wel, mag ik uw aandacht voor uh, meneer Roger Scrooge. Thank you. Uh. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I apologize that I don't uh, know your language, uh, and I'll be speaking in English, but I'm reassured that everybody here will understand what I say, or roughly anyway. <laughs> I, I hope what I propose to do is to speak very informally about the issue of, the, the general issue of the relation between liberalism and conservatism, and then say something more specific about environmental questions because I think these are very important and a kind of test of a political philosophy in the times in which we live. I, I will speak very informally and I expect you to ask questions about the things that concern you, uh, you know, when I've stopped. Um, can you understand me? Am I speaking sl slowly enough? Yeah. Okay, you can interrupt me if, if you need explanations anyway. Uh, okay, so um, obviously I, I'm, um, I'm speaking as, a, a, as an Englishman and somebody who represents a long tradition of, uh, of political and social thinking of a kind which was connected with a particular social order and a particular uh, conception of, of uh, the role of the nation state in the in the wider world and it, here in, in uh, Belgium you are heirs to a very different history and um, a very different kind of politics uh, moreover as we all know Belgium began only in recent times as a, as a nation state and is now probably collapsing as a nation state, or at least dividing into two. And, um, and so your, your conception of what the political issues are is going to be very different from, from mine, for, uh, from the, the historical point of view. But still, there are general truths about the liberal position, about the conservative position, which I think r apply to every uh, political order in the modern world. So I just want to say a little bit about the meaning of certain basic terms. Uh, as I'm sure you realize, the word liberal has changed radically in its meaning over the last 150 years. It, in the middle of the 19th century, a liberal was somebody uh, uh, like John Stuart Mill, who uh, had inherited a particular conception of the, uh, of the uh, workings of government in which human freedom is the central idea and government is there to protect freedom and to amplify it. Uh, but now, uh, uh, largely due to the rise of, uh, of the American liberal left, the word liberal is often used to, to denote a, a more uh, statist position uh, in America in particular. So somebody who calls himself a liberal is very likely to be a defender of some version of the welfare state um, and to, to defend also the amplification of state power to take charge of social uh, and political difficulties and is probably distrustful 
of the idea of individual liberty and, or, or freedom uh, as a, a potential disruption of the social order. Now, I think you're used to that ambiguity, aren't you? Uh, and um, I, I'm told that your club is a, exists to defend classical liberalism, as I say, liberalism as it was understood in the 19th century as the, ultimately the defense of individual freedom uh, against its confiscation by uh, uh, the state powers. But um, there's another distinction which also has to be made, and that's between classical liberals uh, and libertarians. And I think this is the, perhaps the most important distinction uh, from the point of view of modern politics. Uh, a classical liberal is somebody who believes that uh, individual freedom uh, is the the aim of government, the government must defend individual freedom uh, from uh, uh, the uh, countervailing forces, uh, and that, that is the true scope of politics. Whereas a libertarian, I think, uh, tends to go further uh, and to see the entire politics as de devoted to, to liberating people, liberating people not only from the oppression of others, but also from their internal oppression, liberate their, their um, sexual lives, liberate, their, uh, liberate them from the, the weight of tradition and the weight of moral authorities that we all carry around in ourselves from our childhood. So a libertarian might be somebody who actually, in the end, believes in using state power to, uh, to change the way people are, uh, or at least using it to break down existing social <coughs> structures uh, and um, so social traditions which keep people, uh, as it were, locked into a, a specific uh, uh, form of life. Does anybody want to sit in the front row? Is, uh, you can do that. Or I know it's, uh, you're, it means that you're very close to the enemy. But, um, <laughs> it's probably the best of standing at the back. Um, So uh, I think those distinctions are familiar to you, uh, are they not, between the, the various forms of various meanings of the word liberal? Uh, uh, and uh, there is a real question as to where the conservative stands in relation to these things. Uh, and I, I think it's best explained in the following way, that, that conservatism, at least as we in Britain have inherited it, is compatible with classical liberalism, but not with left liberalism, and not with libertarianism. That, uh, that um, uh, the classical liberal position is something which can exist, coexist with a conservative attitude to the social order, but um, uh, left liberalism and libertarianism are not <coughs> compatible with the conservative attitude. Now, uh, this is really quite important because when, uh, when Mrs. Thatcher was in office as our Prime Minister, uh, she was often criticized uh, by people, especially on the left, uh, for being essentially uh, an anti-social force. You know, her kind of uh, uh, emphasis on liberal economics and free market principles was regarded as also posing a threat to the moral order. And it was a very useful argument for people on the left to make because it was a way of uh, conscripting old-fashioned conservatives who would have voted for Mrs. Thatcher to, uh, to feel suspicious of her. You know, that yes, we shouldn't introduce market principles into every area of social life because that just undermines the traditions and the uh, uh, conventions on which the moral order depends. Now, actually, that argument uh, was made uh, early on in the, by Marx in the Communist Manifesto, which begins with this kind of um, encomium of bourgeois society, saying that, uh, that under the, under the uh, rule of capitalist uh, um, production, all the old principles and old forms of life and old traditions and customs are blown apart. Uh, society is fragmented and the ground is prepared for the new revolutionary movement that will replace capitalism with, uh, with some form of socialist econ economic order. Uh, and um, 
that argument constantly recurs. You know that liberal, the liberal position involves the defense of the free market against traditional forms of order, and therefore is a threat to the conservative position, which wants to maintain traditional forms of order. However, in um, the intellectual tradition of British conservatism, uh, classical liberalism has been always combined with some kind of conservatism. In uh, Edmund Burke, for instance, uh, who was the founding father, I, I suppose, of modern conservatism in, in Britain, uh, in, in Edmund Burke, you find a defense of liberal economics with uh, conservative thoughts about about the social order. And Burke did not regard these as incompatible. He thought that on the contrary, they stem from the same uh, original in insight, uh, the insight which, it, uh, which we could express by saying that human <laughs> beings owe their individuality and their freedom to the social conditions in which they are uh, brought up. That we, that we are not born free, as Rousseau thought, but we become free through our immersion in social uh, traditions and, uh, and customs, so that we are made free by our social membership, and it all depends upon the kind of social membership as to how free we will be. Do you understand that, that thought? And that, that is a, a very fundamental thought in Burke. You also find it in, in Hegel and in De Mest, who are, of course, contemporaries of, uh, of Burke. Um, I don't know whether you read, does anybody here read Burke, or Hegel, or De Maistre? Yeah, I know these are thinkers that should probably have been uh, banned from the university curriculum, haven't they? Uh, and this is presumably this university, a kind of um, uh, a socialist gulag like everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you wouldn't be allowed to read these. You can still discover them in libraries, uh, where at least so, uh, but the, the, this thought that Burke had that somehow to the theory of the market that was developed by the Austrian economists, the economists, uh, say, um, uh, Bum, Lavec, and, uh, and Hayek in particular, uh, and uh, says. Now, Hayek's view is an extremely interesting one. Uh, he defended the market in economic matters, uh, not on the grounds that it uh, produces or maximizes the freedom of the individual, although he did believe that, he defended it on epistemological grounds, right? on the ground that the market was necessary in order to generate and propagate uh, economic knowledge. And his thought was something like this, that if you, in a free market, people exchange goods according to their own perception of what they need, uh, 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 and, um, and what the demand is for the things that they have. And they exchange goods uh, freely uh, uh, on the assumption that, uh, that uh, somebody, the person who obtains their goods is obtaining it freely and they are relin relinquishing it freely. In those circumstances, uh, uh, Hayek argued, the price of goods becomes uh, an indication of exactly how much people want them and how much they're prepared to sacrifice in order to obtain them. So that the price contains a very important piece of information, not information about what you want, but information about what others want and what they're prepared to sacrifice in order to get what they want. In other words, it, it contains information about the um, economic uh, thinking of all members of society. But it's not information that can be explicitly stated, you know, in the form that John wants this, 
Mary wants that, etc. It's it's ta what he calls tacit knowledge, uh, in, uh, and it's knowledge of some of uh, information which is socially produced and so socially maintained. So it's a kind of information that exists in the in economic activity, but can't be extracted from it and made into a proposition. Do you understand that? It's, there's, there's a lot of knowledge that we have like this. For instance, your knowledge how to ride a bicycle. Um, you all have that knowledge, but you couldn't put it in the form of a proposition as to what you should do next, when, and such and such happens. It's something which is, as it were, contained within your body uh, and, uh, and exercised by your body. <coughs> in a similar way, economic knowledge is contained within society and exercised by <coughs> all the members of society in a condition of free exchange. But if we replace that condition of free exchange by a plan, you know, um, as to say, the, uh, an economic plan of the socialist kind, which fixes the price of this and the quantity of that, etc., and then we, all we do is destroy that information, the information that is necessary for economic, for the economic functioning of a social organism. So his argument was that, uh, that, what, that what's wrong with the socialist plan is not that it destroys human freedom, although that may be true too, but that it, is, but that it destroys economic knowledge. In other words, it destroys the knowledge that is necessary for its own success. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a very interesting argument because it means that in fact it's going to be logically impossible for a socialist plan to succeed in, in replacing the market economy. All it will do is drive the market economy underground, uh, which is what we've seen. Uh, uh, your generation is fortunate in that it never did see what went on in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, um, as my generation did, but we, what we saw was very clear. There was a, pl a planned economy which was complete, a complete fiction, and there was another black economy underneath which was a real one. Uh, which operated just the way that economies do everywhere by generating this form of social uh, social knowledge that is contained within prices. So everything had a, an official price and a real price, and it was only the real price that mattered. But meanwhile, of course, the plan uh, went on uh, rem remorselessly destroying the institutions of civil society and, and the, the economic soup infrastructure of the nation. Right, so do you, do you understand that argument? Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible, it's a really important argument because it, it, it bypasses all these dis discussions about freedom uh, and tells us something quite different, that actually um, the free market is to be accepted not because it is free, but because it's a market. In other words, because it, it, it generates the economic information that people need in order to live at peace with their neighbours. Now, Burke argued in a very similar way, not about uh, economics, but about tradition, um, that likewise, people depend upon socially engendered knowledge. He didn't put it that way, but that's roughly what he meant. Uh, the kind of knowledge that's contained in uh, traditional forms of social order and social interaction. Uh, uh, that. Uh, this is, again, knowledge which is tacit, which we don't make explicit to ourselves and probably could not make explicit to ourselves, but is nevertheless integral to successful human interaction. Now, um, perhaps uh, uh, there are two examples of this which I think both of which are extremely interesting but also rather difficult to talk about in the modern world. One is um, the common law. Uh, we, are, we in Britain, or in England at least, are a common law country. As I say, law has traditionally been uh, uh, generated through the judgments of the courts and not imposed through uh, the decisions of Parliament. Parliament has also made laws, but these laws have been, uh, as it were, packed on to a, a pre-existing body of, of, of organic, organically connected decisions made in the, in the courts of law. And that, uh, the common law, so understood, is a kind of tradition, uh, a tradition which involves the resolution of individual conflicts, one after another, under the, the accumulation 
of a form of knowledge in the, in the taking the form of principles. Uh, and that, that kind of thing Burke uh, regarded as absolutely integral to a, a proper social order. And that there are, as it were, questions that we all have, conflicts that we all get into, and resolutions of these conflicts and answers to these questions which emerge over time. Uh, over many centuries often, and finally come, come up with a, a, an enduring solution which enables people to live peacefully together, uh, uh, trusting in the law to bring some kind of justice to their disputes. So that, that's an example of, of what he meant by tradition. Perhaps an, but another and more intimate one is that of marriage and the family. And this is very pertinent to the age in which we live, because um, marriage and the family are both under attack, both uh, uh, from the libertarians on the one hand and from the, uh, the, the socialist orthodoxy on the other. But Burke's thought would be something like this, that human beings depend upon sexual relations for their fulfillment and happiness, uh, and each generation depends upon the previous one for having got this right. You know, uh, the, uh, without stable relations between parents, children are disoriented and, and don't learn the fundamental uh, uh, gestures with which to survive in society. So uh, it, each generation depends upon there being some kind of stable and settled relation, sexual relations between uh, the parents. But those parents in turn depended upon that. And yet there, is, there are no abstract principles that people follow. There is a kind of instinct of courtship followed by uh, the institution of marriage which contains within it the knowledge that parents need in order to exist peacefully together and devote themselves to the bringing up of children. And that kind of tradition is very obviously fundamental to social reproduction and to the perpetuation of what economists now would call social capital. So there's a couple of examples, uh, but um, Burke's defense of it is very, si of those examples, is um, very similar to Hayek's defense of the market. That these things are important, these traditions and institutions, because they contain within themselves the knowledge that people need in order to live successfully and peacefully together. Um, but it's not a knowledge that can be translated into abstract principles. It's, it lives in the institutions in the way that economic knowledge lives in the market. Right. Um, so the, the problem that, that we, uh, or the problems that we confront today, in my view, largely um, arise from the fact that while, while the liberal defense of the market has been accepted, uh, because there's people have come to realize that there is no real alternative. Uh, there is nevertheless a, a loss of confidence in the social institutions and traditions which have grown uh, in our communities over the last uh, 500 years or so, and which have enabled us to make use of the market so successfully. Uh, and though, so the, the problem for conservatives in the modern world is how to how to, uh, as it were, safeguard those social institutions uh, without um, also sacrificing the, the liberal inheritance in, in economic life. Often socialists come <coughs> in my country um, campaign uh, uh, in the following way. They say, look, uh, all these market economics has, uh, has simply undermined social institutions, we uh, um, socialists are going to restore them, and we're going to restore them by using the, the power of the state uh, to bring security <coughs> and, uh, and comfort to those who are the victims of the social dis disintegration of our time. And you have, that argument is made here in Belgium too, isn't it? Um, uh, and in fact, it's made uh, it's, uh, all across Europe. And somehow socialism is there not to um, produce a new kind of socialist economy. We agree that we need the market economy, but it's there to produce a new kind of society, to um, use the money raised by taxation in order to introduce social justice into the surrounding order. 
and this means uh, completely rearranging things and making the state rather than the family the, the principal institution to which people turn in their hour of need. Uh, and um, that is what has been happening all across Europe. And I think the conservative position is that not only is that not necessary, because in fact the family and the, uh, and the and individual communities can take the charge of their life successful, successfully, not only is it not necessary, but it also it is going to be counterproductive in just the way that the socialist economy was counterproductive. It won't, the state cannot replace uh, the ordinary traditions and customs through which people relate to each other successfully. All it can do is make them dependent upon a great administrative machine and, then, and thereby lose the sense of responsibility for their own lives. And I think that argument is beginning to be made. And if you make it, of course, you are immediately accused of being uh, cruel, uncharitable, um, having no compassion for the poor, etc. Uh, e even if you're motivated precisely by the opposite. So there is, a, you know, we know that there's a, uh, a whole rhetoric here which has to be dealt with very carefully. Uh, uh, and it's a rhetoric which um, comes largely through prejudices that have been inherited from, inherited from the socialist uh, experiment. Right, so that's um, all I have to say about the relation between liberalism and conservatism. Are you happy with it? <coughs> With that, so I will, I will go on and talk a little bit about the environment. Yeah, as a specific, a specific question that we all have to deal with. Um, I, I'm not saying that anything that I've just said to you is, um, uh, you know, is gospel. It's all very controversial, and I think uh, people, conservatives, have a lot to learn from liberals and vice versa. And both of us have a lot to learn from socialists as to what human motivation is. Um, but it's a one-way process. I've noticed in my career as a, as a pariah that, um, that while uh, we are on the right are constantly willing to learn from people on the left, there is no willingness to learn from us. Uh, on the contrary, there's a, a desire to demonize people on the right and say they have nothing to... to to tell us, and the sooner they're locked up in the concentration camp, the better. Um, but so far, we've been uh, we've been allowed up to a point to live, not in universities, it's true, but in more civilized institutions. <laughs> so, uh, just about uh, talking, I just want to talk a little bit about the environmental conditions because they are so important, uh, and what a conservative approach to them is, and also what liberalism has to say about them. Uh, um, as we know, the, the environmental agenda has been largely confiscated by the left in our time. That's to say, um, it's been regarded, certainly since the 1970s, uh, as uh, an area of political thinking which uh, it naturally lends itself to the, uh, to the left, leftist approach to politics. Uh, this is for a variety of reasons, but Two in particular, I think, stand out. One is that, that uh, leftist politics always depends upon identifying a victim, preferably a, 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 as large a victim as possible, and a, 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 an evil oppressor who is responsible for that victim's uh, failure or, or distress. Uh, and uh, in the case of the environment, you've got a very good way that, thereby of um, of uh, reanimating the old leftist vision. The victim is the, the earth, everything, everything around us uh, and uh, everything upon which we all depend. And the oppressor is of course the big successful businessman uh, um, or conglomerate as, as always, the person who's doing well out of things. Um, and and this, this is a structure in, uh, in leftist thinking which is impossible to remove because I think it is implanted in us by evolution. This, this sense of resentment towards the successful that, and the sense that, that they are to blame for anything that happens to the rest of us who are not successful. Um, the, the desire to blame somebody who's doing well out of things it is an immovable part of the human condition and I think it's always recruited by people on the left 
because it's a, it gives you an easy solution to any political difficulty. You look out of your window and you see the, the terrible damage that's being done to your environment um, you know, um, by uh, 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 the buildings that are going up in, in, in Ghent or the, the devastation of the countryside round about and you say who is responsible? Of course it's the person who's making money out of this uh, and, that, and um, a new social order would confiscate all his wealth and redistribute it. So the environment naturally lends itself to that attitude. So it's, it's, that's one reason why the left was able to confiscate the agenda. But there's another reason, and I think it, equally interesting, which is that environmental problems uh, tend to <coughs> leak across boundaries. They are not easily bounded uh, problems. In particular, of course, problems with the atmosphere, uh, you know, increasing carbon dioxide content, problems with the oceans, with ri rivers that, that flow through across continents, uh, diseases which migrate uh, uh, from crops uh, um, to, to other crops and so on. All those problems d uh, don't respect national boundaries and have an, uh, have an in innate tendency to become global. Uh, and a global problem seems to demand a global solution, a solution which is uh, uh, organized at the very highest level and then imposed uh, ac across the whole of the, uh, uh, of the um, global economy. And I think that, that again lends itself to left-wing ways of thinking which are inherently suspicious of the nation state or, 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 and suspicious of any form of, of localized loyalty, or localized uh, authority and always looking for an internationalist solution imposed from the top, uh, which, which um, prevents people from uh, taking charge of the problems themselves. And we see that, that, that if you look back again to the Communist Manifesto, the whole uh, tendency of, that, uh, of Marx's argument in, in the Manifesto is to replace all the local forms of political order with a, a new international order which will <coughs> not respect the boundaries at all but to dictate uh, uh, solutions, comprehensive solutions for the world as a whole. So those are two arguments why the left was able to ca capture and confiscate the environmental agenda and left um, both conservatives and liberals largely <coughs> unable to say anything. Uh, and in particular, by, by emphasizing the, the idea that our main, uh, the main environmental question, the problem is climate change, um, the, the left effectively uh, said that there is no solution which, uh, which can be uh, generated at the level of the nation state. Uh, and so nations have, as it were, been, become irrelevant. And that is a very important uh, uh, conclusion on the left because they independently uh, the people on the left have regarded the nation state uh, as in some sense either oppressive in itself or at least a, a relic of an old way of doing things which they want to replace. Right, um, the first thing to be said in response to that of course is that, that the um, left-wing politics which advocates these top-down solutions, solutions which are dictated from above, uh, is uh, bound to uh, have problems of its own. And that if we look at the actual history uh, of um, socialism in, in, uh, in office in, uh, in the last century, we will see that top-down solutions have not solved <coughs> environmental problems, but in fact caused them. Uh, the ecological disaster uh, of uh, the Soviet Union is well known to everyone now. Even even today, there are parts uh, of Soviet Russia which cannot be visited um, because of the uh, pollution by radioactivity or, or um, chemical pollution and so on. Uh, the wiping away of whole landscapes that has occurred in China and elsewhere uh, is a disaster far greater than anything we've seen in Europe. And it's a disaster made possible by top-down control. Because uh, under socialism, the, the people who are doing the controlling and the people who are also uh, um, wanting to avoid the controlling 
are the one and the same, namely the, the bureaucrats in the state. And, and none of them ever have full responsibility for what they do. Nobody has ever been called to account for the environmental disasters in the Soviet Union or, or in China. So, and so we know this, we know that in the, uh, these top-down decision-making procedures, in fact, all they amount to is a collective evasion of responsibility. And if you think that, uh, that the main problem with the, uh, with the environment is precisely that people are able to uh, escape responsibility for what they do, then you ought to be suspicious of top-down solutions. And I think that's what, something that, that uh, liberals and conservatives share, this suspicion of uh, solutions to our problems which are dictated from above by people who don't actually uh, take uh, responsibility for what they're doing or have the means of evading responsibility. Uh, and uh, it, the classical liberal response is to say, look, um, of course people are apt to uh, um, do things which destroy their environment. They're apt to, to um, carry on their own lives and pass on the cost of what they do to future generations or to others. But the, the solution to that is precisely to have a, a system of law which stands above the market and which holds people to account for what they do. In other words, um, you should not have the one and the same agency both taking economic decisions and also uh, correcting them for that when, when they are abused. And so the law should stand above the market, but it should be controlled by some completely different authority from the economic, that which controls economic life. And that, that's essentially uh, what we all agree with now, um, but how to achieve it is one of the, the great problems. Okay, so in my book on, on, on this, uh, I argue that, that uh, the liberal response, uh, which tries to find market solutions for, for all these problems, has a lot to be said for it, a lot more than, than people on the left generally credit it with. Uh, that if the people left to themselves do work out collective solutions to their uh, environmental problems in a variety of ways, but most of all through negotiation with each other as to the distribution of the costs of what they do. And there has been a lot of work in economics recently, particular, particularly by Eleanor Ostrom, who got the Nobel Prize, what she did, uh, showing how traditional communities have been able to take charge of their own local environments and distribute among themselves both the costs uh, of uh, operating their shared economic life and also the benefits in ways that, that perpetuate resources. Uh, in in Nor Norway, is the, uh, a very good example, the Norwegian um, fisheries, which, um, as you probably know, still produce uh, sufficient cod every year to supply the market, um, both the local market and the export market, and it, it constantly regenerates itself. For a hundred years, uh, the uh, Lofoten fisheries have been operated on a cooperative principle whereby people are uh, assigned uh, and agree to the assignment of shares in the, in the available fish, and then and the uh, fisheries are maintained in a, in a viable and sustainable way because they recognize their shared responsibility towards the, uh, the resource and are able to uh, as it were, correct each other's misbehavior as local conventions, local little courts of your law and so on, which ensure that this resource is properly used. So, and down the centuries people have, have done this. I should say that the that the potent fisheries have been nationalised by a socialist government and are no longer properly maintained. But you know that just illustrates the, the principle. Uh, so, if we uh, allow uh, people to work out solutions to their local problems uh, on, on those principles, very often environmental uh, de destruction is not the result, but on the contrary, some kind of per perpetuation of the environmental benefits. Also in common law systems like ours in England, we have a law of tort, which um, it's, it's essentially ensures that the person who damages things pays the cost, so that there is a, 
feedback mechanism. If you, put, if you produce environmental damage, then uh, the person who's affect, affected by it can take legal action compelling you to take full responsibility for the cost of it. Again, this is, illustrates those principles that I referred to earlier, uh, Hayek's defense of, uh, of the uh, epistemology of the market and Burke's defense of the uh, of social, socially uh, generated knowledge. It, it, it illustrates those principles at work in small local communities. Uh, and uh, I think this is the most important thing that I would have to say, that in local communities where people understand each other and take responsibility for their own actions regarding each other, in those circumstances there is a, an inbuilt tendency of, of, uh, to r r restore environmental equilibrium <coughs> when it is uh, when it's upset. Uh, and that tendency lies in human nature, in the motive that we all have to be uh, accountable towards those whom we know uh, and on whose uh, good opinion we depend. But the basic environmental problem comes, of course, because when people are not uh, in personal relation with the, those whose, whose uh, assets they destroy, then there isn't the same motive to behave responsibly. In, in such circumstances, people have a natural tendency to, uh, as economists put it, to externalize their costs. Uh, and uh, that's where all environmental problems begin, this, this uh, tendency to externalize the costs of what you do. It's not a question, it, it, this isn't an illustration of um, the inadequacy of market economics, but rather it's uh, an example of the places where um, the laws of the market are being evaded. They're, they're evaded by state bureaucrats, of course, when they uh, avoid responsibility for their decisions, but they're evaded by the rest of us when we try to pass the costs of our action to somebody who didn't incur them. And that is uh, 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 something which, uh, insofar as we can have an environmental policy, it must prevent that, or at least present an obstacle to it. So the real question I think both conservatives and liberals confront it is how to, how to uh, ensure that people internalize the costs of what they do, that they themselves pay the costs of anything uh, that affects their environment, so that they're given a motive to restore the environment when they damage it. And I, I, I just in conclusion want to say what I argue in that book on green philosophy. Uh, I argue that, um, uh, that there is something in human nature which generates other motives than the motive of self-interest, and that this thing is familiar to all of us, and it's what each generation depends upon in the pre preceding one in order to inherit what, um, what is its natural birthright. And I call this motive oikophilia, is the, the love of home. Uh, and um, although you know, these are difficult things to talk about in the world in which we live, I, I think that if you look at the um, human condition that throughout the ages, you will see there really is an independent motive that, on which people have drawn in, in every kind of crisis in order to survive it. And that motive is the love of the, the place and the people and the, and the form of life which is ours. If you go back to the founding document of our culture, which is um, Homer's Odyssey, which I hope you have all read, but you probably haven't, but it, at least it hasn't been banned by the socialist establishment yet. Um, the Homer's Odyssey tells the story of a man who, who gave up immortality and life with a goddess in order to sail across the most dangerous seas to his home and repossess it because that was what, not only what belonged to him, but also what made him what he was and what gave him the motive to live in the first place. Uh, as you know, he, when he got there, he found that indeed the, the socialist state had taken it over, but he was able to claim the kind of vengeance that his we are all deprived of and shot them all to death. So, um, uh, and that story is a very important one because it really does remind us of something deep in, in all of us, this, this sense that we belong somewhere 
and that that thing not only depends, not only does that thing depend upon us, but we depend upon it, uh, and we depend upon maintaining it for our uh, uh, for future generations, and also we are answerable to previous generations for what we do to it. Uh, and we see this motive at work around us, uh, and often people on the left uh, obscure it because they uh, they present us with uh, such a narrow vision of what environmental problems are. If environmental problems are typified by the, uh, the problem of global warming, so, so it's simply a matter of um, you know, what are we going to do about our, our waste products that, um, that pass into the atmosphere, if that's all they are, uh, then it's, we find ourselves at a loss for any motive that people have, ordinary people like you and me, to do something about it. Why should we do anything about it? What can I do that, that uh, you know, the whole thing is hopeless? Uh, but actually, that's only one environmental problem, and of course a very controversial one. We know uh, environmental questions which are much nearer to heart, where we immediately see the truth in what I've been saying about Wikipedia. For instance, you, know, you live in a, uh, or at least study, in a beautiful city, um, and for the most part, it has survived. Yet when you see one of the old buildings in the centre of Ghent being pulled down uh, uh, and some uh, modernist gadget being put, put in the place of it, uh, you, you tend to think, yeah, no, this, is, this shouldn't happen. This is my home as much as yours. You know? uh, uh, and um, something in you reacts against it. That's a, that's a paradigm of uh, the environmental response. You know, this, this is something that we share. It's something which is which is connected to my identity as, uh, 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 as much as to anybody else, uh, and that I have a duty to, uh, to do what I can to maintain it in a, as an environment that I can pass on to my successors. That's a, uh, and I think one of the defects in environmental thinking on the left is that it has not taken the question of urbanism seriously. It's not taken seriously the, the, the problem of the human habitat. And yet, after all, that is the primary habitat that, for which we're responsible. Uh, 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 if you look back at the environmental movement in its full complexity, and this is, uh, I'll just end on this point, if you look back at the history of it, you will recognize that uh, it's not a creation of the 1970s, uh, as we would think if we looked at Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and all those big NGOs that make such a fuss. It, it goes right back to the 17th century in, in England, not so sure about this part of the world, but at least to the 18th century here, um, in which people became aware of the intimacy of their relation to the, to the landscape and to the, and to the townscape, and the need to maintain it uh, as a, a collective habitat that they could pass on. Uh, and not in my country, which of course is not Typical, but nevertheless very, very important. In my country, this um, this feeling, which which arose during the late 17th century, gave rise to the school of landscape painting uh, and the, the um, school of um, naturalist poetry and so on. Um, it soon became a, a political force during the 19th century, not through government, but through individual civil associations, people getting together uh, and founding little communities of interest uh, to protect aspects of their environment, um, largely under the influence of Wordsworth and, and Ruskin. But, it, uh, but it, this ended at the end of the, ended with the formation of the National Trust in the 1890s, which is a, a, a private civil association, independent of the state, which has now four million members devoted to preserving the landscape and preserving a viable uh, natural uh, environment independently of, of, of um, state control using natural civil initiatives uh, and, uh, and lobbying for the kind of legislation that will continue to protect things. So I think if you look at the actual history of the, uh, of the environmental movement, you will see that oikophilia is, a, is a, a permanent feature of the human condition and has been used to defend the landscape, not uh, through the state, but in spite of what the state is trying to do. 
and, and uh, I suspect that that is true here too, uh, although of course Belgium, uh, I mean you've had some very unfor unfortunate things happen here uh, it, it, when it comes to the, to the countryside, but at least your towns and suppliers you've uh, had any conscious of them, consciousness of them, you've tried to protect them. So there's a, that's a summary of uh, my position on the environmental question, putting it in the context of the debate between liberalism and conservatism. So now it's up to you to ask me. You can ask questions about anything else if you like. Um, yes, sir. Uh, what do you think about the, the, the relationship between Christianity and the, the, the preference for the poor and the greedy and uh, as socialism? Mm. It's, I think it's a difficult problem. Yeah. Um, it's, a, well, it's, it's very controversial because, of course, uh, the Christian religion it began it began among uh, as were at the bottom of society uh, and um, worked its way to the top uh, and there has always been a question down the centuries as to whether the true Christian way of life involves renunciation of all the, uh, the benefits of power and splendor and, uh, and property and um, Christ's own parable well, his own response to the young rich man who who came to him asking what shall I do to be saved when he said uh, give, give away all your money to the poor and, uh, and follow me and when, uh, uh, that response was, uh, has often been used to, to, to justify the view that the true Christian way of life is incompatible with, with the ownership of incompatible with wealth and perhaps incompatible with the particular kind of uh, market economy. Socialists often cite this, but um, you know, my response to that is to say to the socialists, okay, uh, uh, what I would say to the socialists <coughs> is just exactly what Christ says: you know, get rid of all your property uh, and distribute it among the rest of us, and then follow me. But that's essentially the liberal position, uh, and um, you know. Uh, Christ also said that the poor you have always with you, when he when he claimed, by way of um, you know for excusing the of the use of all that expensive ointment to bathe his feet. Um, so there is a all religions have these you know a, a contradictory attitude to this sort of thing because we, there is a contradiction in the human heart about it. And we resolve it by recognizing that it's for each of us individually to take responsibility for the use of what we have and to make sure that we don't use it to oppress others but to help them. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, as a solution to all the environmental problems, do you think it would be a good solution to do a kind of 21st century enclosure of the commons instead of trying to make big international treaties which all yeah. the member states don't apply? Uh, I think that's a very good uh, response. That is essentially what Elena Ostrom is defending. You know, uh, forms of, of the enclosure of the commons which, which are uh, conducted for the benefit of the local community that makes use of them. Uh, and certainly the big international treaties, uh, uh, they don't work. And a very good example of this is the common fisheries policy um, of the European Union, which uh, tries to distribute, uh, to tries to enclose all the territorial waters of the European states in one uh, great block, and then takes charge of distributing them the, the goods among the members, but it is so corrupt that it just simply means that it opens those uh, waters to predation by all the individual uh, fishing fleets, in particular the Spanish fishing fleet. Uh, and um, as a result, the North Sea is, is more or less dead. Uh, uh, it doesn't contain any cod at all, but uh, you, you can still get cod from Norway because there you have an enclosed commons, which is outside the 
the European Union, of course, uh, run by the local community. And so that is, I think you're right that that is the, the only way forward. But uh, of course, when it comes to the atmosphere, there's no way of enclosing it. Um, you know, much as you might like to, to put a, a wall stretching into outer space around Belgium, it's not going to work. Or you could um, find the firm that's guilty in one country. Oh, well, yes, you have to have other yeah. means. That's not the same means as enclosing the commons. There, there, there are ways in which you can proceed. Yeah. <coughs> And we do, you know, uh, 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 if you think, forgetting about carbon emissions, but th it's going back to smog, you know, those poisonous pods that, that came out of the Industrial Revolution, which um, used to hang over London and effectively pollute the air and, and cause a great deal of, a great many deaths. That was, that was eliminated just by, by fining people for using the wrong kind of fuel. Uh, so you can get somewhere uh, and you can uh, you, we could imagine going back to the other problem that we are all now thinking about you can imagine something like a carbon tax which says you know the, the more carbon you put into the atmosphere the more you have to pay well, the, the only problem is that with, with the carbon taxes it will end up in the hands of socialists uh, as all taxes do <laughs> I'm going to act as my own chairman, but so, yeah. Okay, carry on. And what do you think about the carbon emission trading system? Do you think it's a solution for the carbon-oxygen problem? Or? I, I do talk about this in my book, and I think it's a very complicated thing, because the trading system that has emerged in Europe has been so prone to corruption, and so difficult, it's so expensive to operate. That, that in effect it has made things worse but because the, the Italians, for instance, um, fixed their carbon emissions, uh, declared their carbon emissions much higher than they actually ha have, so to get more certificates and then trade them with uh, other countries. Uh, so it was it was used entirely as a political uh, uh, bargaining counter in order to obtain. Uh, 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 the liberty to do whatever they wanted and also to make money out of it. Uh, and Kyoto likewise was, was based on the idea of carbon trading but uh, you know, it collapsed because there's just, there's just no way of estimating how much people use or, or what would be a, a fair allocation of certificates in the first place. Uh, it, it, ha it did work, it does work in, in the individual nation state uh, and it, it worked in, in um, America uh, with sulfur dioxide emissions. So that, that, um, that certificates were issued to people, <coughs> giving them permission to emit uh, <coughs> a certain amount, and they were able to trade them with those, so that those industries that really had to emit sulfur dioxide ended up doing so, but paying for it, and those that didn't have to ended up not doing it. So it worked very well there, but it was within the context of a single jurisdiction where people were under pressure to deal honestly with each other and so on. So I think it, 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 it could perhaps work at the national level, but as but that doesn't do any good. I mean, it won't help. The atmosphere is under threat much more from China than it is from anywhere else. And nobody in China has ever done anything for such a foolish reason as the fact that the law requires it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my question is about the first part of your uh, talk, um, the link between classical liberalism and conservatism. Uh, your argument seems to be one about compatibility, um, but do you also think there is a necessary link, there is a logical link between the two, and mm -hmm. can the two, <coughs> can one go without the other? Or? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good question. I didn't really go into that. You're, you're, you're right, I was trying to say they were compatible. But I also wanted to say that the, the deep philosophical argument for both of them is the same. That the, the argument for liberalism, especially in the economic sphere, is about the, what is necessary, uh, the, the necessary uh, connections between people in the present in order to um, 
uh, to act successfully in the economic sphere. The argument for conservatism is about the necessary connection between people across time so that they inherit knowledge, <coughs> the necessary knowledge. Um, uh, and so that since it's the same argument, one applies in one case uh, synchron synchronously, in the other case uh, diachronously, uh, diachronously um, that, uh, that they ought to be compatible. But you, you're asking a deeper question, which is, uh, uh, might they actually be mutually dependent? And I think that's really something that Burke and his followers have argued to be the case. They would say that the market economy, of course, depends in the end upon uh, uh, traditions of social accountability. Uh, 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 it depends upon virtues in the citizen, which are only acquired through the, the, the citizen's immersion in a particular social order. Uh, and I think this is something that Adam Smith already recognized in The Wealth of Nations and in his book, The Theory of the Moral Sentiment. He, he believed that uh, the free economy did depend upon um, a virtuous citizenship. And that, that, that involves uh, institutions which enable people to take full responsibility for their lives. So yes, I think that in the end, they are mutually dependent. Uh, it's also about the first part, part of your talk. You have uh, said a lot, a lot about the links between liberalism and conservatives, but what do you believe are the differences? differences between right. Well, <coughs> this is the same question really going on a bit. Uh, I think that um, there's a kind of liberalism that tries to um, extend the idea of market solutions to every area of human life, you know, um, and this is where the conflict arises. That, that there are certain things that the conservative thinks cannot be uh, put on sale, so to speak. They can't be, part, they, they can't be made into a market. Uh, or sex is an obvious one. Uh, of course there are, there is, you know, there are market transactions in the sexual sphere, but um, but the conservative view is that actually this is a sphere which has to be rescued from the market where people uh, um, make absolute commitments to each other rather than, than purely contractual agreements. Uh, and without, because without that absolute commitment, you are not going to guarantee the, 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 the next generation. And um, that's one argument. Uh, I mean, there are lots of other arguments, but that, that is a sphere in which um, the, the conservative instinct is to say, you know, the market stops here. There's a, we're in a different area of obligation, a different kind of obligation. Uh, and likewise, between parent and child, etc. You don't put your children, you don't sell your children when you're in, uh, when you've got problems with, with, with how, whether you can afford a new refrigerator or not. Um, and, Anything like that, which has to do with what the Romans call pietas, you know, the, the piety, the pious relation to life, so the, rela the relation which, in which you humbly accept that, you, that it's not up to you simply to decide how things should be. Uh, that, for the conservative, is, would be ordered in another way. Whereas liberals can actually go get overexcited by the market idea and think, no, there's a market solution for every problem. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, end up with a kind of uh, anarchistic uh, uh, approach to, uh, to, um, to social life. And, uh, many libertarians are like that. So, you know, if, 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 um, if people want it, that's great. Let, let, just let it happen. And uh, well, that's what we are seeing, of course, in, in, in an extraordinary way in the modern world. A, a libertarian complete libertarian approach to the moral life with a socialist approach uh, to the consequences. You know, the consequences are you know, people from dysfunctional families <coughs> and all the rest, uh, and the state then takes charge of them and, uh, and looks after them, but doesn't really look after them, just gives them the resources to go on being anarchists. Point of view 
migration is compatible uh, with the individual freedom? <coughs> Probably not. Um, there is a on the, the migration question, of course, we in Europe are under great pressure, as we all know, uh, as to what we're going to do about the fact that, that we don't produce enough children to, to uh, maintain our way of life, but that the uh, immigrants that come in uh, don't respect that way of life anyway. So, you know, are we going to just say that we're going to relinquish it? Uh, and let another way of life take over. Uh, uh, and um, my view is that, that uh, uh, intellectuals can easily say yes, uh, because they'll, they'll go on existing in their universities, enjoying their state-sponsored salaries, uh, and, um, uh, and congratulating themselves on their compassionate way of life, uh, which um, but uh, ordinary people cannot say yes. We cannot say yes to uh, to uh, relinquishing the the home and the community and the way of the way of dealing with things, which ordinary people depend upon if they're going to have children and uh, and <coughs> live the sort of life that that uh, they themselves were brought up to expect. So they will always resist. Uh, and um, the, the true responsibility of the state, it seems to me, is to ensure that that um, the nation, in whatever form, is continuous from one generation <coughs> to the next, that, that actually that the, the sense of belonging that, that one generation has is passed on to the next, and that, that, that immigrants who come in are disciplined into accepting this and, and joining it, and then joining in the passing on process. If you were, on, on the other hand, simply allow immigrant communities to form their own uh, kind of oikophilia as a separate organism within the within the nation state. Great. Eventually you'll end up with the situation of the old um, Yugoslavia or the old and Balkan states uh, which will be uh, one on the verge of the collapse into civil war at any time. So, uh, so you, uh, you know the conservative approach to, as I understand it, to immigration, is to try and prevent that happening, to, uh, to ensure that there is an integration into a continuing, continuously developing national idea. <coughs> but but that, can, um, that, can only, that is only possible if you control uh, immigration. Well, uh, do you think uh, the welfare state has the large responsibility in uh, preventing migration, integration of immigrants? Yes, uh, the welfare state makes it possible to live in an unintegrated way because uh, uh, it, it subsidizes living apart. It, it, uh, it, 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 in the old, I mean, I know this is a very difficult topic to talk about because um, there's so much censorship, you know, um, as you, I'm sure, are aware. Uh, but if you say the wrong things or things that are judged to be wrong by people on the left, then uh, you know you're dismissed as racist, fascist, all the usual stuff. Uh, I guess people are pretty bored with that now and recognise how stupid it is. But if you look at the history of this, the old American uh, experience of in immigration was a very good example. To get to America, you had to make incredible sacrifices. You had to sell everything get onto one of those ships with your family and all the rest, land in New, in New York where you were given a hard time by the immigration people. Eventually you get across onto the dry land and the first thing you do is work. And then you, work, you, know, and, uh, and then you try to belong to the thing around you uh, and you take an interest in it and you try to speak English even to your own children, etc. Uh, uh, and the result is integration. You know, people only the best people manage to get there, you know, after all these hardships anyway. Uh, and when, once there, they worked to integrate uh, and to, to, to be part of what they found. Not always, of course, the Sicilians did not. They came, uh, you know, with, a, with their own mafia-like connections uh, and lived apart for an awful long time. But even they eventually integrated. Um, but uh, with the welfare state, things change. It, it becomes easy to immigrate. 
uh, to, to, to come in uh, and you'll get subsidised as soon as you're there, even if you've got no job. So, um, and, and if you're coming from a place which has not got a welfare system, there's, you're, essentially you're, this is always going to be an, uh, an economic advantage to you. So you get a completely different kind of immigrant, not one who wants to play a part in the, in the community, but one who wants to take advantage of it. And I, I guess that's where all the difficulties arise, especially in this part of the world. Uh, do you agree with most uh, English conservatives that um, Britain should loosen ties uh, with Europe, with the European Union, or perhaps even leave the European Union as a whole? Uh, I don't uh, agree with the idea that we should leave, leave the European Union, um, but uh, I, I certainly think we shouldn't be bullied by it, uh, and I, do, I, I also think that the European Union is wrongly constructed. I, I don't think it should have this massive power to legislate for all the nation states independently of their own parliaments. You know, I think that is the thing which which is very particular. That, that laws uh, there are something like 180,000 pages of these laws, the Akikumanakumanakare, which are made by bureaucrats, uh, and, uh, and they're totally, many of them totally absurd, and, and nobody understands them. And yet we still have to obey them, even though our parliament has not discussed them. I, I think that that system has obviously been a great mistake. How to change it is another matter, but I think it's for the, it's for the nation states to get together and try to change it. Um, what I, my, my vision of the future is that um, Britain should uh, forget about Germany and France, who are the great beneficiaries of the European Union, uh, and get together with the uh, other states, in particular the East European states, to, um, to uh, uh, form a, a group which refuses to uh, adopt a law if it hasn't been discussed by the national parliament. Uh, and that would change everything for us. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I think um, then it might be perfectly okay to stay in the European Union, but we can't just stay in it and allow it to control everything that, that we do. I think there's a, 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 a feeling all across Europe of this kind, you know, that, 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 we're, that we've, lost, we've lost control of the political process, we've handed it over to people who are not really accountable. And I, think, uh, I think people feel that in Germany and France too. think of state-funded education? Um, yeah, what the state-funded education. Um, if it is education, yeah. that's great. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a, we've seen this all over Europe that the the when the state funds something it also takes control of it. Uh, uh, and and it and the people who are taking control are not necessarily themselves educated or they don't necessarily have an appreciation of what educational values are. I think that we always have to have a private sector to set an example. Uh, I went to a state school, uh, a grammar school, which was built on the example of the private schools, of the pub, what we call public schools, um, Eton and places like that. Uh, so my school was really good, um, uh, uh, but it was there because it had an example to look up to, you know, what it should be doing. And so I got a free education, and people here get a, a good education still through the state schools if they're in if they're in nice local nice small communities where they've got dedicated teachers and so on. But uh, of course, in the big cities, it's uh, it's another story. And, um, Okay. This is a question all across Europe again, what, what would you do as the alternative? Uh, and I suspect that um, the best alternative is to encourage private schools to grow and to give parents, instead of paying, for, uh, to the state paying a school directly, to give a, a voucher to the parents, which is worth so much money, they can spend it on whatever school they want. And that way there'll be some pressure on the schools to do what parents want. Though, of course, 
if parents are as ignorant as they tend to be, it may not be the right thing for the children. Any more questions? No. What you believe in general is for a conservative, uh, for a conservative role of the state, still. Well, I think there is there are there's a primary role for the state uh, that um, that everybody accepts, namely to uh, protect the community from crime uh, and from external aggression. Right, so the, the military and the police side of the state, I think, are, are fundamental. Um, the real question is, to what extent are the rest of the social functions of, of a society to be conferred upon the state, and to what extent should they be emerged from private initiatives? Uh, and we just had this question about education. Uh, I'm in favor of private initiatives whenever they can be depended upon. Uh, uh, because they are much more accountable and they also unite people in a common loyalty. You know, that people, people come to depend upon each other to help each other in, in their times of need and to form a more coherent community <coughs> that way. You know, but of course there, the state has, since the Second World War, it's invaded all the areas where private associations and charities and so on have looked after social life. And so it's become much more difficult to re to return to that because it, it, you're always going to be in competition with the state, which can t has resources that you cannot match. But I think it could happen, and it, it to some extent is happening. Is that it? Uh, I've reduced you all to silence. That's so, Mr. Strzok, very much thanks for this uh, interesting lecture. I think we all enjoyed it very much. Uh, it was a very critical lecture, um, very interesting points you uh, made. Uh, you questioned us yourself. So, thank you for coming so early, and especially to catch you the LPS weekend. Um, Ja, das Ja,